Welcome back to another video guys and today it's about creating um, an arrangement and doing mixing on this 8-bar loop we did in the last video. So if you want to see how we created this you can re-watch the video. Uh, I'll put the link in the description of course and today it's all about progressing from this 8-bar loop to something more like a song or yeah a project basically that you can release maybe um so the first thing is we made this a few days ago so i have some kind of disconnect to this track so i have fresh ears and i can already notice instantaneously some things i don't like so or, or spot some problems so the first one is here the drone the drone is playing all the time and there's also no possibility of sequencing this because it also plays when we hit stop right so it's just playing here so we have to do something about it then maybe the pad here is pretty static there's no modulation on there it's a bit of chorus here and the reverb on there so we can uh, modify this here with some modulators a bit then there's the bass here we can maybe rename here this to bass the bass also plays only on one note so pretty generic and static then there's the arpeggiator here. I don't like the arpeggiator. I mean, it's okay. It does the work. The kick drum is, I think is also okay for now. Yeah. The hi-hats, uh, maybe we can create some glitch effects on there or some breakdowns. Also the vocals play all the time here. So we have to stretch this a bit out, I think. So maybe only on one part you have just this this part here and then maybe later on in the second part you can only hear this. So just spread it out a bit. Maybe we can play a different line here or different lines for the piano. At the moment it just plays in the background and makes some, some ambience, but maybe we can use this to create some uh, kind of topic, a theme, a motive for the track. And uh, the clap is pretty basic and there's also reverb on the clap all the time. So we maybe want to alternate between different things. So, okay, um, these are basically my initial th thoughts about it. There's also something you can notice on none of these tracks is a dynamic processor besides peak limiters. And most of the times these peak limiters do nothing. They just reduce volume or increase volume, but there's no limiting happening. There's no dynamic processing happening. And I really like to do this when I am when I am in the draft drafting phase or in the creative phase where I just put down notes ideas without having to worry too much about dynamics and mixing and mastering and all that stuff uh, because I noticed when I do that then I'm constantly switching around between different tracks and trying to you know increase the loudness here and then squash it there and distorted here and so so i'm basically um spread across all these different options i have so here i'm limiting myself to only uh basic things to put down notes put down a basic patch or sound and then move on and now we are in this phase and i can see there's maybe a nice track behind all this generic stuff and i can put in some some hours some work and make it shine more or better or make it even um, a real good track so maybe let's try this here and start with the drone so i said this is playing all the time even when we hit stop here so there are multiple ways of sequencing this we can use it the output um, output of this grid and just automating this here just putting in here some lines right this is something we can do or we just use a note clip 
And inside the note clip we just put here some kind of note and it doesn't matter, matter which note or which key I'm using. It's just having a note there and we are using the gate on signal coming from that in here. Using a select, switching it off by default so the output here is going into nothing, right? It's using the input one where nothing is happening. And then we use here a gate in and every time we play a note we switch this to on which is the case here with this clip so now we can use this clip to sequence basically our generative patch so here we don't want to have a drone and here we want to have drone so this is also something uh, you can do but we also probably want to automate here the output volume later on to fade something in and fade something out okay so the second thing i want to do is probably to group all these uh, tracks together so the drone the arp um, the vocals the piano and maybe the pad sound here is all something i want to have in a group so i group this with Control and g and rename this group here to maybe music or atmospherics i don't know and then we have here the kick the e hat the xo and the clap and this is of course drums and we have the bass and the bass and the drums together go also in a group and we call this group drum bass group which i like to do and then we group the drum bass group and the music group here together and call it all okay and um, I do this for multiple reasons but I don't want to explain this any further because um, yeah it's, it's um, yeah it's just a habit and so now that we have this we can just leave this alone here and clone this first block here into a second one by just holding control and dragging this over and what we do now is we're creating basically different alterations of our initial loop. So we have this loop here and then we create another one and try to create a different version of it that sounds a bit different. And we can use this later on then for arrangement. We could then arrange multiple of these blocks and yeah, can create some kind of arc uh, song structure from it. So here I don't want to have the vocals in there, I don't want to have the arpeggiator in there and maybe I remove the piano part. So I'm having here our drone in the background and the beats. So this is maybe an alteration that's okay. Then we can create something like um, where there's no drone and uh, only the pads maybe so this would be maybe a percussive part where you have more the focus on the rhythm so when we have the focus on the rhythm we can do something with the bass so we can um, uh, change the repeatings because everything is just one note in here right um, it's just one note and the rhythm comes from the repeater here. Yeah? And when we change the repetition setting here, we probably also want to use a quantize here. So everything is quantized to a 16 note grid. So we can play around here with these repeats without losing, you know, the main groove. And let's create here an automation point. Um, oh, this is that's the wrong setting. I want this one here. Okay. And here now it's much much faster playing the maybe we want to increase here the, um, the cutoff so the cutoff is a bit wider so we can do this here
also use this opportunity now to tweak the base here a bit. Maybe bring the delay in front of the peak limiter. This is okay. So I want to basically scratch here the ceiling of the peak limiter to get it exactly at 0 dB. That's basically my um, uh, my my line or my gain staging line. Usually when you use uh, when you see gain staging tutorials about gain staging at a much much lower point, maybe minus 12 dB or using even LUFs, so like an RMS level, something like minus 12 loves or minus 16 loves or even more. Um, but I like to use here uh, the 0 dB line because it's much easier to do this here with that limiter. You can see what's happening and you can see also here if you touch the threshold. Now I also can easily um, control the dynamics. So I, when I say this bass sound is way too dynamic, so the the distance between the peak and the RMS level is way too high, then I just increase here the input, squash it against the threshold here, which is the zero dB line. So I'm doing two things at the same time. I'm making sure that nothing goes uh, above zero dB, and I'm also limiting or decreasing the dynamic range at the same time because I'm bringing here the meat of the audio signal up to the 0 dB line and everything that's speaking is squashed down. So I'm doing two things at the, t at, at, at the same time. If you do mastering or gain staging with a much, much lower LUFS level, let's say minus 12. So you normalize everything to minus 12 LUFS, right? And then you want to decrease the dynamic range. You can do that, but then after you put on the, the limiter or the compressor, you have to make sure you bring the level up again to the same minus 12 LUFS. So you normalize, then you do compression, and then you normalize again to bring it back to the same level. And then you're constantly fighting with the auto gain, um, finding the right balance between dynamic range compression and bringing up uh, the level to your gain staging level. So here, um, I'm just increasing the input, squashing everything against the uh, uh, ceiling. And I'm limiting the dynamic range, and I'm also hitting my um, gain staging target, which is zero dB instead of minus 12 loves or something like this. This is the, the main benefit, basically, of using the zero dB line um, as a as a target. Okay, so maybe we leave this here a bit dynamic. This is okay. I don't want to scratch, squash the space too hard. You can also use a, a compressor in front of that if you want to. If you think the limiter is too hard, too harsh to the signal, you can also use a compressor for that. And um, then use a limiter at the end to um, make it limit basically at the 0 dB line and uh, make sure everything is stays below 0 dB. Um, but I'm okay here with the peak limiter for the sound most of the time, so I don't use compressors that much. I also don't want to squash the signal too much and I don't want to limit the range too much because everything in here is digital. And when you use a digital synth, most of the times it's pretty static. It's not like an analog synth where the volume constantly moves up or down or you have a drummer um, that plays the, the drums and some hits are louder than or quieter than the other inside the computer most of the times everything is pretty static so you don't need the compressor that much besides maybe for some gluing reasons on a bus but usually everything comes out of all of these vsts vst plugins pretty straight and pretty even so yeah that's that so here we have zero db 
and then the base itself you can see I have here minus 3 dB so at the end here we end up uh, at minus 3.3 .3 dB so it's not that I want to peak with the base at 0 dB in my song right so here we are at 0 now I want to have it minus 3 dB or sometimes even minus 4 and this is basically a rough number for my bass sounds my basses are usually 3 or 4 dB quieter than the drums and it's also just a rough number because it also depends on how many um, upper harmonics you have for the bass so if you have just the sub bass then you probably want to have minus 3 um, so yeah, it, it, the number depends basically, but this is uh, a rough number basically, minus 3, minus 4, uh, it's usually, it fits very well with drums that are peaking at 0. So the drums peaking at 0 dB and the bass peaking at uh, minus 3 or minus 4. And then most of the times the mix down is okay-ish. Um, so now that we have this, Maybe look here at the drums. So drums also the bus here itself. There's no dynamic processor on there. The kick drum here is peaking probably also at um, at zero dB. Just to make this show, we put here. Um, so this is zero, and then we have a hard clip here on there. Using a peak limit at the end, so we can see what's going on. So there's a bit of small bit of room, so we can push this into the hard clipper here. And this hard clip preset by myself works exactly like the limiter. There's basically at zero dB, there's a line, there's a clipping line, and you push the material into the zero dB threshold. You can see nothing surpasses basically the zero dB line. You can see we are at minus three because of the ceiling. Right, so this is way too much, of course, but we can drive the kick drum a little bit into the clip, into the limit uh, clipper, but not too much because we want to do this multiple times on some of these buses. So I keep it just a touch, maybe one dB. It also gives some nice harmonics sometimes for the kick drum. Right, so you get some upper harmonics for the kick drum and it sounds more full and more fat but it all depends on what kind of kick drum you are going for so this is basically creative decisions and mixing uh, at the same time so you, you need to make a creative decision if you want to have this kick drum um, that distorted but you also have um, to make sure that you can hear the kick drum on some smaller speakers or some headphones, right? So you need some up harmonics, some saturation on there. And if you think the hard clip sounds too hard, then you can, of course, use in front here some soft clipper or maybe um, a saturation, saturator of Bitwig here. Dial in a bit of um, roundness here at the top. Maybe get this like this. So get a bit of harmonics in there, a bit softer harmonics, or you can also use the amp device. And then use the clipper here to make sure everything is at zero dB. So the kick is pretty important because it's usually my loudest uh, part in, in the complete track. So this is my my key point, my key mixing um, anchor. Um, and this is coming from drum bass. That's my habit. Um, it's probably not usual when you do ambient or chill out, but I'm using this basically as my main goal. This is the loudest part, the kick drum, and also gives the pulse, the rhythm of the track and everything else is below the kick drum. So I make sure this is very peaking at zero dB and it's the, it's, it has the right fatness, the right uh, overtones. And yeah, 
So now we have this at zero dB. Here's nothing. There's nothing on there, and also on the all tracks, nothing. So, so nothing changes the loudness of the kick drum. You can see here at the master, it's still at zero dB. So the clap sound here is, yeah, is there's reverb on there all the times so we. I remove this and I have a random a random reverb trigger here that I made. So every time the kick drum uh, this the snare drum plays, we have here a probability thing. This probability thing triggers basically this ADSR and this ADSR opens up then here the reverb mix down. So we have sometimes a reverb on the clap and, so, and most of the times not. So this brings in a bit of interesting variety over the course of the song. And that's also not something I can sequence. It's just random, right? And I like to have it that way. So every time you bounce the track, it's it, the reverb is at a different position. So then I don't like the clap itself. It's basically just white noise. It's okay, but maybe I want to group this here in an instrument layer and I put in here a sampler. And the sampler I probably want to use here Rimshot. I'm always using Rimshots as you can see. So let's listen to some stuff here. Maybe it's something like this. Disabling here the key tracking. And this is, of course, the quiet. Maybe you do this a bit quieter here. And then we put also here in a hard clip. And I wish we could introduce here some visuals into Pitwick. You can see the clap is not really peaking at 0 dB here, so you can increase and drive this a bit into the clipper. Okay. So we have here the clap rim. And then we have the hi-hats here, these two. Maybe you bring up here the, also everything to zero dB. You can see we need 16 dB here to reach the ceiling with some of the heads. So I'm using also your hot clip and dial in 16 dB and bring this back. So instead of running this into a limiter, I'm running this in a clipper. You can delete this. Okay, so this is nice. Also the same here with this one. See, we need here 11 dB. So do the same. So hard clip is usually really nice on drums. Move this. Nice, we can remove this. And because we have everything at zero dB, this bus is a lot louder now because some of the elements are overlapping. Maybe this is a bit too much here. Okay, so the hi-hats I usually want to have a bit quieter. So I'm having now full control over the hi-hats because I know all of these hi-hats buzzes here are peaking at 0 dB. Nothing goes above 0 dB and they're barely scratching the surface of 0 dB. Because all my tracks here at 0 dB, I can completely control now with this slider here how loud 
or where are my hats are peaking i can say minus four and now i know all these high hats are peaking at minus four okay because everything in here is limited exactly or clipped to the root db or maybe go to minus eight Still too much. So now on the drums, I can do something like a transient control and can bring up the sustain. What this means is basically everything between the kick and the snare is pushed up which has some kind of gluing effect. That's basically what you do when you use a compressor and then um, or a gluing compressor where everything in between the drums are getting an up in loudness and you have this feeling that the, the snare and the kick is everything at the same loudness and goes through the same bus or processing. So we making basically the heads quieter here which brings everything down in loudness. But here the transient control brings up the loudness of the hi-hats in between the kick and the snare. But when the kick and the snare plays, the hats go down. So you have this pumping effect on the, on the hi-hat automatically just with this transient control and using the hi-hats here, a bit driving the hi-hats a bit quieter into the bus. So if I turn this off, you can hear it doesn't sound different. can see here everything kick snare everything in between is, is pushed up in loudness and then i'm doing most of the time some uh limited uh, some uh, balancing of the frequencies and i used to use here fx3 and uh peak, limit, peak limiters in there right i can see in the low um oops, in the low uh, in the low part here we have the kick drum most of the times of course it's the uh, most of the low frequencies and I push this up also here to the zero dB line also the mid bus and the high part and then I put also here art clip at the end so this is basically EQing here, what, what I'm doing here. And if you put in a EQ plus, you can see it's pretty straight, a straight line. Maybe put this to freeze. It ends up here straight line. And it's a straight line on the tilt setting of 4.5 dB per octave. I think 3 dB per octave is pink noise. You can see it's even more straight there. So it's pretty much pink noise-ish curve, curve EQing and limiting at the same time. So it's more or less I'm super lazy and I want to have uh, um, consistent effects or consistent loudness on, on things and balancing things easy. So instead of going in with the EQ here and, you know, going out to these holes and correcting this until it's happening here, I'm just pushing everything up to the ceiling of this limiter without limiting too much, but still limiting in a way. Um, and then ending up with a nice frequency balance and also all of, all of these um, bands are compressed or limited in a way. So I'm pretty sure nothing goes above this straight line here. And you can drive this even more so you can put in here more rock and make a creative decision there. Something like this. You can still see it's still an even line. So um, that's what I used to do and you can also do that. That's pretty fine. Uh, but nowadays I'm using here this crossover module, which is a VST plugin without an interface. 
and there's also a preset on there I made myself. And this is basically an FX5. So instead of three bands, I have five bands here. Um, one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, five bands. You can also limit this to three if you want to. And there's a um, layer here for each band on there. And on each band, there's a dB meter, which basically analyzes the loudness. And then I can normalize the signal by peak and make everything peak at zero dB by just with, with just one click. And then after this, there's a hard clip and just a limiter to check if everything is okay. And I basically just analyze here the drums a bit. And the dB meter here measures the loudness, also the peak limiter. And then when I hit this button on all of these bands, all of these dB meters, are normalized here to this M button, which is the true peak max. Right. So now I know on each band, everything is peaking at zero dB. It's basically the same thing I did before with the, with the FX3 and the limiter. But here I don't need to drive basically um, the input to the limiter. The dB meter does this automatically. So now I'm, I know exactly everything is at zero dB without clipping because this dB meter is pretty exact. And then I can use this clip thing here. And this increases the input on, on all of these hard clip modules inside these bands, right? So I can clip multiple bands at the same time by the same amount. So the balance is the same, but I can clip or multi-band clip basically. I can decide if I want to have distortion on there or not. I can also go in the negative way so I can keep the balance, keep the same balance, but I can decide to back off from the limiter at all, right? And then the hard clip is not needed here anymore because at the end of this one is also a hard clip here that just limits off basically zero dB. Ah, this delay is, uh, I think, a bit too much. Maybe the reverb is also a bit too much. So I'm trying to mix basically at first the drums and the bass because it's the uh, it's the fundament of my of my track. Um, it leads it's, it leads to everything basically to the rest of it because um, it's all about it's it's all across the the whole frequency spectrum. So the sub is in the right in the lowest frequencies then we have the kick drum on top of that then we have the snares the hi-hats covering all the high ends so the drums and the bass basically this bus here um decides on how my whole track is balanced in the end because it's yeah it's ranging over all these frequencies so it's pretty important to me um so now that we have the drums and the bass in there um the mix sounds quite okay I think. The drums are not too much compressed and the bass is also not too compressed. So I make sure I have this I get this right. 
And here on this bus, which is a drum bass bus, I also maybe can use a transient control. I don't do this all the time, but sometimes it, it works pretty well. So we do basically the same here, open up the sustain a bit, which does the same. It brings not also the, the hi-hats up, but also the bass, which is between the kick and the snare or between the kick. And um, it's kind of gluing the bass and the drums a bit together. So it's it's important that you don't overdo this here on the drums itself because here you do it also. So maybe you have to dial this a bit back here. And then we do the same here with the, with the crossover. And sometimes I I I would say don't overdo or don't be too precise with all the settings as you can see i quickly move on it's the same with the draft for me um, i just dial in some parameters i know that works i know that this is probably too much then if if i need to dial in something like this then something is wrong and um so i have so i have this experience of all these parameters i dialed in before i used before and i see at certain points when something is off or when I need to um, make some drastic changes and I know instantly uh, something is wrong on some other channel. So if you do this all the time, then you get some numbers in, you remember some numbers and you remember and you see instantly when something ha is happening wrong or something goes in the wrong direction. So um, yeah, I'm dialing also this a bit in and then I'm using crossover here, analyzing the, the bass, the drums the, again. Now what you can do is here also bring in some kind of side chaining and I use here the note side chain and we can use from the DB track drums here the kick output right the, it's, it's a MIDI trigger or a note trigger so we can use this note trigger every time the kick comes in and we want to bring down the volume here of the bass it's probably too much but Sometimes I don't even want to remove the bass completely, like here. It's going straight up down to minus infinity. That's maybe too much. Um, you just want to go down a bit, right? So just move the bass a bit out of the way. You don't want to remove it completely. Like a lot of glitch shop producers do this, and it's kind of the sound design uh, process or the style of the track but i think sometimes you need to leave some overlapping frequencies in there to glue them together it's it's pretty dumb to actually cut everything out and then you put a compressor or an odd ott on some of the buses just to glue everything together again it's you need to overlap frequencies to say to the listener hey these songs or these sounds belong together they are meant together, right? If you cut everything out, then it sounds like a chopped, I don't know, sausage. So it's okay when frequencies overlap. So we have a pretty clean, solid drum and, drum and bass bus here. And it's probably also pretty loud. So we can measure this here. Short term loudness max minus 11 already. And you can easily increase the loudness by just driving this into the clipper here. See, it doesn't sound that distorted at all and we are at minus 6.9 here so i keep it a bit picky reset 
Um, also here with the CB meter, it's a very handy tool actually. And I use this tool uh, because it has only numbers. Um, and it seems like a lot of people like the visuals. And so when you have these, um, you know, these lines moving around and but for me, actually, if you look at this all the time, you remember certain numbers and you see exactly when something is off or when something is at the right level, right? So for instance, short term loudness max is basically a short term loudness like this, but it only remembers the last, last biggest number. So it, it tells you basically where, when you analyze the whole track, you see here, um, the loudest short-term number, right? So it's the loudest part basically that's remembered here. And this is the short-term loudness I usually use, but short-term loudness max is pretty nice. I analyze then over um, a longer period of time and then I use this here to um, tweak something to this number basically. Um, then there's also the loudness range, which is basically the the same thing as in RMS, the crest, the crest value. And this is the, um, this is the difference or the, the, the distance between the RMS level, the meet, the loudness of the track, the, and the, the, the highest peak. So it tells you basically how dynamic, how dynamic your material is. And when you put this, for instance, on drums, you're the drum bass bus, you can see we have here a loudness range of eight, seven, yeah, seven laughs. And you make, for instance, an album where you have multiple tracks on there. And you probably had this issue before where one track sounds completely fine. The next track sounds even it's the same loudness and it's the same frequency spectrum. It sounds completely different, right? And that's mostly because you have a different compression or dynamic range on the drums on different tracks so on one track you have super compressed drums but the rest is peaky and on the other track you have peaky drums and the rest is compressed so it sounds completely different and off and here you can put this on the on the drums or on the drum bass bus and you can remember certain um, loudness range numbers and you can tweak to that you can say i uh, make an album and an on this album, all my drum buses have a loudness range of 0 0.6 laughs. Okay. And then you can tweak everything to this loudness range. And you know exactly on every track you do, um, there's kind of similar loudness range on the drums. So they, the tracks don't, don't sound too, yeah, different each time. So this is pretty important sometimes when you do an album or you want to do multiple tracks. And like I said, if you watch, of, watch all these numbers all the time on different instruments and buses, you can remember these numbers and you can see instantly when something is, is wrong instead of having this line, this nice line over time in the visualizer. I think this is much, much better. Um, okay, now also can resize this here, which is neat. Um, and then again, EBU mode is the mode you want to use. RMS is the old, old world basically. Um, it's even older than, uh, it's not older than the VU meter stuff. So VU, RMS, uh, stuff like this, you don't need actually anymore. So if you don't know about RMS, you don't need to learn it. <laughs> Just go for EBU. Remember the loves um, stuff here because there's not only the, the peaks and the RMS levels in there, there's also um, a weightness curve of the frequency spectrum in there. So um, it depends on how, in, in, which, in what frequency something is louder or quieter. So it's all integrated in this kind of standard. So use EBU, it's the only thing you need. Okay. So now we have the rest of the song, Atmospherics. Okay, yeah, there's everything in there. Usually on these type of buses here, 
I don't use what I use on the drum bass plus because it's way too harsh and it's all tailored to uh, to drums and keeping it loud. Here I am using most of the time something like Gulfos. Something like live if I want to play it. And sometimes I use just a normal Gulfos. But here you can just remove some resonances pretty easily. And maybe a peak limiter. Also drive it up to 0 dB. See the piano here is peaking sometimes. That's okay. So here you can also use a compressor, maybe the smart smart comp by Sonable. You have some nice profile here. Mix acoustic maybe electronic. Let's let's, let's use acoustic here to have more dynamic range in there. So you have a bit of compression here also. Um, there is the spectral compressor in there which ducks a bit of the harsh frequencies or kind of remove resonances. It's basically the same as the Go Force here. So we probably can remove this. That would be fine. If you do this too much or if you overdo this, then you can completely remove the character of the sound. So um, you have to be cautious with this. So leave in a bit of um, characteristics or resonances. Just, you know, balance it out a bit. So now this is scratching here, also 0 dB. It's balanced with the smart comp, also a bit with the cold force. then we need to mix it in. So this is a completely taste thing what I'm doing here. And try to find the right balance between the atmospherics and the drum bass bus. And maybe we need to low cut here the bass out so the the kick and the sub has free room here to unfold and also i like to use your two pole um eq curve just to make it smooth i just want to tame a bit i don't want to clinical remove everything i just want to make some free room right this is too cold just have a bit of room here, down here. So of course, this is in the in the mastering uh, section of the master itself. This is a bit too harsh, right? It's too cold, too bright. And, but I like to have it that way because I can um, have everything peaking at 0 dB and it's pretty straightforward. I don't need to think about everything. I just have these numbers and I know um, I'm good, basically. So to remove this harshness, I basically do on the master, I do an EQ curve or you can use an EQ plus here, for instance. remove some of the harshness here or some kind of tilt EQ and you can trick it the way you want it or the way you like your end result just to tame the high end here so this is something you can do what I like to do is again using a dB meter 5 here and say I want to have at my master I want to have minus 12 luffs. So 
this is my my target volume basically for this track it's an ambient track or a chill out track and minus 12 is pretty loud if you make drum bass you want to probably have here minus four or something like this but i am going for maybe minus 12 sometimes i go for minus 10 which is also pretty loud but i come from drum bass so i like this right you can also go to minus 16 i think spotify is minus 14. um so yeah these are basically numbers you have to to know so i'm going to minus 12 and then i'm resetting this here and then analyzing basically everything you can see the short term loudness max is at minus 10 so it's already too loud so when i push here this m button match loudness then you can see the gain is removed probably two loves I mean, minus 1.5. So it's turning down the volume on the master to reach this minus 12 lotus level here. Maybe let's go to minus 10. So it makes it a bit louder. So it increases the volume. So now we're peaking here over the 0 dB line, as you can see. And before we put the limiter on there, I'm using a DSEQ 3. DSEQ 3 is here exactly at 0 dB, the threshold. So everything that goes above 0 dB is going into this resonance filter, which is kind of something like Gulfos, but with Gulfos you don't have a threshold. There's Gulfos is analyzing the whole signal all the time and you just dial in the amount how much you want to change the signal. But here you have a threshold. So if you don't surpass this threshold, nothing is applied basically. So now we're driving here basically, of course, the high end more into this DSEQ3 than the low end because we have this pretty bright signal, right? We have evened out this everything and here we have also a slope of three which is the pink noise curve you can also dial in here 4.5 if you want to tame this a bit so now even more high end is removed because this is a more gentle curve frequency curve but having this here at zero db it removes all the harsh and harsh top end Um, I see the this is the bypass. Right, you can hear all the hi hats on top, and when I disable bypass, you can hear it go. It goes away. And then having here also attack and decay, so it's working like a compressor. So you have more influence on how. You can also leave here some frequencies through in the attack phase or completely remove everything this is removed this is the delta so having this removed I put here an elevate newfangled envelope elevate and also this one here is at zero db as you can see because i'm having all these numbers and at zero db i don't need to think about gain and how much i want to drive something into it i just have my numbers and leaving everything at zero db at works basically like automatically so i have the input gain here at zero db because i only want to remove uh, or limit stuff that goes above 0 dB. You can see we are at uh, 3 dB or over 0 dB. So everything above 0 dB gets tamed by the filter bank and the limiter and the clipper here, the spectral clipper. You can see the yellow thing here is what goes in and the blue is what goes out. So there's a bit of limiting and compression or clipping happening. Of course you can check out how it sounds when you drive it more but I leave it here at 0 dB
Yes, the ceiling at 0 0.2 just to have a bit of room at the top to prevent clipping when you upload it to, to Twitter. Spectral Clippers also at 0 dB. And everything works out. So I can dial in here basically the loudness I want to have, which is minus 10. And then everything that's speaking above, it's taken care of by the DSEQ3 and the newfangled limiter. Now I put this here a dB meter at the end check the loudness you can see we are at minus minus 10.5 so it's basically the the loudness we want to have here with minus 10. Also EQ plus um, freeze. It's on a tilt setting of 4.5 dB per octave. It's pretty straight. So maybe we have to remove here some mid frequencies at certain points, but it's pretty evened out. So that's basically what I do, but I it, it took much longer to explain everything what I do, but um, you can see I have a lot of zero dB settings everywhere where I push things to my um, to my uh, gain staging point, which is not uh, minus 12 dBs, it's zero dB. And I take care of the dynamics pretty easily, bring everything up to level. And then at the end here, I've taken care of all the harshness with the DSEQ3 and uh, uh, limit at the end. And the dB meter basically controls my um, my loudness level. I can dial this in here and have every level I want to have and reach this pretty easily. Um, it's also pretty clean. Everything is in its, in its place and maybe i have to make some creative decisions here maybe the pad sound is in the same octave than the drone maybe so there's some overlapping there so i put down the the pad maybe an octave lower something like this so this is then uh, the experience and how you want to have your song sounding um okay and this is probably a one hour video now and it's not about arranging at all a bit of arranging maybe i put this in the next video uh, the arranging maybe i leave this um, at this point so you can think about it can um, replay the whole video and maybe ask some questions about this process and then in the next video i show you how we can develop this into an arrangement um, we touched a bit of arrangement here with the uh, with the grouping, which causes the, the first part, you have now here these these big blocks you can move around, and we just duplicate basically all these blocks here. And in the in these kind of blocks, we add iterations or it's alternations of the first initial uh, eight bar loop, and then bring in modulations and automations and uh, transitionings and yeah, make a whole arrangement out of this. Okay, I think that's it for this video so far. Um, if you have some questions, leave it in the comments. Subscribe to the channel. Also, make sure you hit this notification bell. It's pretty important on, on YouTube for some reason. And subscribe on Patreon because you can download on Patreon this, this project here and can uh, try it out for yourself. I hope I make... I made everything clear how, this, how I progress with this. There's also... Um, some differences, small differences between different genres, how I, I how I approach this. On drum bass, I do something more drastically than on ambient. Sometimes on ambient or in chill out, I don't do all these grouping th groupings here. I have maybe just all these tracks in one bus and leave it there because I want to have all the dynamics in there. Um, so it's it's not every time the same. It's it depends on the on the track itself but the whole 
the overall workflow is basically the same. So it's gain staging, uh, frequency balancing, bringing all the elements into the right frequency spectrums, right? Um, EQing and then um, on the master bus, I add some finishing touches and make sure nothing goes above zero dB. Okay, thanks for watching this video. See you in the next one and I hope uh, you like this video. Bye.